Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another lesson from God's Word, and we're studying Luke's life of Christ. Today we're in the Gospel according to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5 and verse 1. Luke 5 and verse 1. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them, and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now we'll get uh, more details as we go along through this passage, but that's enough to begin. Uh, we saw at the end of chapter 4 that the crowds were coming to the Lord Jesus and that they were beseeching him to stay. Doubtless there was a lot of curiosity. There was a lot of being impressed by the miraculous and the healing that he was doing. And yet some were undoubtedly attracted to his preaching, to the word. And we know uh, the Gospels tell us in several places that people were astonished at the authority with which he spoke, even as they in the synagogue in Nazareth had been astonished. Luke 4 tells us that earlier. So here again, the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God. And if you came to the Lord Jesus, what you were going to hear was the word of God. This wasn't opinion. This wasn't stuff made up off the, off the cuff or a man's ideas. This wasn't uh, parroting human philosophy. Our, our Lord was a man of one book. In his incarnation, the Son of God, as he walked on the earth, had continual communion with his Father and the Holy Spirit, and he wanted to preach the Word of God, and that's what he would do. He would speak forth the Word of God. Here he was by the Lake of Gennesaret, which is another name for what we call the Sea of Galilee, and there were these two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. So obviously the fishing had already happened before the Lord came on the scene. They, they're already out of the boats washing their nets. This is something that they did apparently after having those nets in the water and they'd have to come out and attend to them to wash them and repair them and so forth. But Verse 3 says, he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. Now again, we see the preferred rabbinic posture of teaching was to sit down, and that's what our Lord did. He did this at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He did this in Luke chapter 4 in the synagogue at Nazareth, and we see it again. He's basically using this ship as an impromptu floating platform where he's going to sit and teach forth the word of God to the people. And so when he's completed this, he tells Simon there to put the uh, ship out farther. He said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, master, that, that's a word meaning teacher, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Now, notice what's different here. The Lord Jesus told Peter, launch out into the deep, let down your nets, okay, for a catch. So the Lord's promising a catch, and he tells him nets, plural. But Peter protests. The, the remonstration comes here. We've toiled all night and caught nothing. If I can kind of paraphrase what he's saying. Look, you're very good at Bible teaching, Rabbi. We're glad to hear you teach. That's what you are, a teacher. But we are fishermen. We've been doing this all our lives. We know these waters, and we've been fishing all night and have caught nothing. It's just not the right time for fish. What's more, one of my friends who's an archaeologist points out that the net they would have been using is something called a trammel net, which was great for nighttime fishing, but atrocious equipment for daytime fishing because the fish could see the, the net in the light. So when sunlight was piercing those waters, they'd see that net and they'd steer clear of it. Just like today, if you're fishing with a rod and reel and the fish sees the line, he's not going to come and uh, bite your hook or something like that, unless he's an exceedingly stupid or, or uh, fam famished fish, I suppose. But generally speaking, they'll avoid it. Same here. But Peter basically says, nevertheless, at your word, 
I will let down the net. Because it's you. Because you're telling me to do it. I'll put down the net. Now isn't that so like human beings, we can be like that, right? The Lord tells us, put down the nets. The Lord has something big in mind. The Lord's promising a catch. And what do we say? I'll let down the net, singular. I'll let down one net rather than numerous nets. And of course, the Lord kind of puts the exclamation point on this issue. When he puts down the net, it says, verse 6, when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish. And their net was breaking. So did they need more nets? Yes. If they had put down more nets, they wouldn't have been in this predicament. So verse 7, they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. Now, I like that word partner. It's uh, from the same word group in the New Testament that we translate in other places, fellowship. And it gives us a great picture of fellowship. You can imagine that there may have been other people on the shoreline that day, maybe even other fishermen. And they might have been curious about what was happening. They see Peter out there yelling and waving frantically and beckoning to his partners. Uh, we find out that's James and John, the son of Zebedee, as we go on in the passage. But they see him gesticulating and calling on them to help. And you could be a bystander that day. You could be somebody else. And you wouldn't run to Peter's aid. Why? Well, because you're not a partner in the business. I mean, sometimes I read in the paper about a business whose stock goes down and it doesn't really bother me because I don't own stock in that business. Or their stock goes up and again, I don't get excited because I don't own the stock. I'm not invested in that company, nor am I an employee of them. If I work for that company, I'm a partner in it. I have a share in it, so to speak. And so I care about what happens. Same way with this business. James and John had a share in it, so they were going to come help. They had a vested interest in helping because the profit was going to directly affect them. Now, may I just say that's how the local church is, that we're really not to be spectators at the local church or people that come and just soak up the blessing that others give. I have a friend who years ago had an excellent message, one of the best message titles I've ever heard, it was the question, the Christian, spigot or sponge? Now, spigot, of course, is something that you turn on the tap and it issues forth water. A sponge, in contrast, absorbs water, right? It's something that can soak up something. So which are you going to be? Are you going to be the person that is the conduit of blessing to others? Are you going to disseminate God's mercy and grace as you use the gifts or gift that God has given you? Are you going to be a blessing to others? And are you going to let others be a blessing to you? To be in the church, one of the things that the church continued in, according to Acts 2.42, was fellowship. They had a partnership or a common share in what was happening in the church. They had a vested interest in seeing the church succeed. And they were all involved in the work there, whether it was praying or giving or going and telling someone else or teaching or encouraging or administering or showing mercy or helping or whatever the case may be. They all had something to do. They were partners in the work. And so the idea that we go to the church to be entertained or we go to the church to be merely informed or we go to the church to hear good singing or beautiful music or good preaching as if uh, we're at some kind of elocution contest or a, a speech venue. No, we come there because we are partners in the church. We are in fellowship. At least if we're a believer, that's why we ought to come. Because we have responsibility for that local church. We're invested in it, and therefore we care what happens in it. Now, they beckon to the partners to come and help them. But here's where the really interesting thing happens. They came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. So, did the Lord give them a good catch? Well, yes. I would say this is ample remuneration for using their ship that morning as a floating platform. He was more than paying his debt. And notice Peter's response in verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He recognized that his faith had been inadequate. He didn't have faith. At that moment, he recognized that he had been disobedient. He didn't do exactly what the Lord told him to do. 
He recognized that he had doubted the Lord, and he realized the Lord was so much greater than he and holier than he, and how could the Lord dwell with him, being in such a state as he? He said, Depart from me, O Lord. Sometimes when we realize, when we get a little glimpse of our weakness in the flesh, when we think of ourselves as human beings and how often we fail, we say, Oh Lord, why do you put up with me? Why do you dwell with me? I am a sinful man. But the Lord did not banish Peter. The Lord did not send Peter away. The Lord didn't repudiate him. He said, uh, rather, down in verse 10, Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So you're impressed with my credentials as son of God and my power and authority. I'm not using that against you. Rather, Peter, I want to broaden your horizons. I want to expand your vista to see that I have a tremendous work for you to do. You're not going to be catching physical fish anymore. You're going to go and catch men. And the Lord was going to use him in that great work. Now, going back to verse 9, which we skipped, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And so when he says, from now on you will catch men, this is the mandate for all of them. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. And that's really what discipleship is about, saying that I'm going to live for the Lord Jesus, that nothing else is going to have my allegiance above the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Lord calls me to continue my business, I will do my business for the Lord, for his glory. I will glorify him by doing it in an above board way, by doing it legally and ethically, by not cheating my customers. If I'm an employee and the Lord calls me to stay in my job and be that employee, I'll do my work like a Christian. I'll do it in a way that glorifies the Lord. I'll do it with an attitude that shows others that Jesus lives in me, that he is my Lord and Savior. And for some, if the Lord calls me to leave my uh, regular day job, so to speak, my some would call it my secular employment, but it's not really secular if we're doing it the way God wants us to do. It's spiritual to serve the Lord where he's put us. But some he'll call to leave that off and to go into the fields, to go be fishers of men, to serve in full-time evangelism or teaching or some kind of ministry for the church. And it may be in your own town. It may be in your own country. It may be on the foreign field. But if the Lord Jesus calls, don't be disobedient. Obey him. Go forth and preach the word. Go forth and catch men. And whether he sends us out in full-time service or not, we want to, again, catch men. We want to fish for them. Now, where do you go to fish? Well, you go where the fish are. So, you know, we have to go out after them to think that they'll come to our church building and that uh, we can just wait for them to come to us. Yes, thank God, in certain places still, people will come to a building that is designated as a meeting place of a local church. They will come and listen to the word. Should we use those opportunities? Absolutely. In fact, since people are not born by natural generation, our children aren't saved because they come from believing parents. They have to be born again. Uh, the church should have the gospel preached in it regularly because we don't know that everybody sitting in the chairs or the pews are born again in the first place. So we should preach the gospel regularly. Secondly, we should teach it because the gospel is the root truth that all Christian doctrine and living flows from. So if we don't have our gospel straight, we're going to be off in other doctrines of Christian life, and it's going to stunt our spiritual growth. We need to have that down so that we may mature in the faith. But, of course, the goal is that the church is the place where the believers are encouraged and built up and taught, and then we go forth into the world and we catch fish. Again, nothing wrong with holding gospel meetings in a building that the church uses, Nothing wrong with inviting your lost friends to come hear the word of God as it's preached week by week. People have even been saved sitting in the Lord's Supper when they see the symbols and they hear the story of how the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, came from heaven, took on human flesh, became a real man, in other words, and laid down that body in sacrifice, and how the Lord shed his blood, the new covenant in his blood that was shed for the many. And so we think about what the Lord did, 
and many people hearing that and hearing believers get to their feet and praising and worshiping God, it leads them actually to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their own Savior. But again, we are to go out. We are to catch fish. And uh, we do live in times, at least in the West, when it seems like there are few that take that mandate very seriously. In my father's generation, and much more in my grandfather's generation, there were pioneers who were going out who were planting local churches. And uh, we still have some doing it today, thank God, but not enough. And these men were going out, and they would go to a place that didn't have a gospel preaching church, and they would start to witness. They would start to give out tracts. They would street preach. They would meet people however they could. Maybe they'd get a little Bible study going in somebody's home. And when there was interest, when people were saved, or when maybe other believers came along and wanted to gather together and follow what the Word of God said, they then began to meet as a church. And as it grew, they would either rent some place to meet or build a building or what have you. And uh, we want to see that again. We want to take this responsibility seriously of catching men for the Lord Jesus. So may God inspire us and encourage us to go forth in the work and to win others to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening.